I want to do a, a, a movie in a lighthouse with two uh, people who go mad and there's, you know, uh, there's some flatulence, there's like a display of power and uh, maybe describe one scene to me and, you know, it's black and white um, with a cherry on top, you know, like just really classic black and white. I knew the setting was at that time sometime in the 19th century. So I really had a few years, the advantage of, of a few years of uh, just thinking about it, you know, we're on to other things, but it's now and then, like an idea will come in there and then you start collecting these ideas. Um, and then the script arrives and then you kind of check those ideas against the specifics. Um, but uh, yeah, by the time I got the script, I already kind of had an idea of what it, what I wanted it to look like. And I would run them, I had the luxury of running them by Rob over that long period as well. Uh, if you know, if, if Rob was going to do a movie about a lighthouse, uh, where the you know, or, or where the lighthouse is a major character, he wanted that Fresnel lens, and that that a big part uh, that was a big influence on um, the time period in which the film set. So he could have that lens, and he needed the station to be of a certain dilapidated quality, but had all these other markers. But anyway, um, so. Um, yeah, there aren't a lot of Fresnel, working Fresnel lenses anymore. You know, a lot of times, uh, you know, what we know um, as lighthouses, what you call clamshell design. So it's just kind of two-sided, goes around. Um, but I had never seen the light put out from a Fresnel lens. You know, what is, because I need to shoot this kind of passing light in some scenes, and I have no idea what that, is it a round shape? You know, I know, I know what a Fresnel light does, you know, movie light does. It's a round pattern, and you focus it and whatever, but this is a totally different thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, we scouted a, an old working station in Northern California. Um, it just had a 60 watt bulb in there and it, it does amplify it, um, to an impressive degree. Um, so, you know, uh, when I looked out, it puts out this rectangular pattern. It doesn't put out a round circle at all. So it's almost like a stripe that just kind of sweeps over and then the next one. But I needed to know, just get my mind around, you know, what is, what does that look like and how bright as it subjectively so I can then interpret that, you know, uh, into exposure for, for the film. Um, the other part was, you know, wh what does the machine room underneath the lantern room look like with all the patterns coming through the grates? Is that a magical thing? In the script it said, you know, ma light, magical light patterns, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I didn't know that would be the case. And so we had to research that. And in indeed, it does put these kind of swirling patterns down there. So that worked out. Very, everyone was very excited. We're making this wacky movie, um, and then you know, eventually they had to bring up like, "Can you look? Can you shoot it on color?" And uh, I, you know, which also get the lighting budget down. But also, they could sell it to you know more territories um, that just won't buy black and white movies. Uh, which anyway, that was not acceptable to Rob because um, he just you know he didn't want a color version somewhere like that. He just couldn't. Be okay with that. Um, and the other thing was that, like, if you shot it on color, it, it's just a different, like I talked about before, it's a different texture. It's just kind of smoother and uh, just more modern feeling. So, um, so we had to convince them of that. Uh, there's, a, you know, there has to be a digital conversation because they're producers and they're responsible. Um, and then we, the wacky ones, have to pick our battles. But that was one where we had to stand our ground. So. Um, I think for there, there was a very encouraging film, which was Fritz Lang's M, you know, uh, that I just watched just to watch a movie in this aspect ratio that I proposed, because I knew it existed. Um, but I don't think I ever saw M, to be, I'm embarrassed to say. Uh, and you, you put the, use the camera in a certain static way, it will feel like an old silent film, you know, of just Robert Pattinson with that mustache scrubbing a, you know, giant foghorn, you know, static camera and the sky's gonna be blown out and the lens is gonna sort of just smear it in the soft way. All these little things are gonna add up to it feeling uh, the, way it, the way it feels. So yeah, it was kind of a general idea um, rather than a, a specific uh, image to, to point to, really. So, but going, you know, just going back to M, I, it, that was an encouraging film because it, 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 you know, it felt like the past, but it has a very ambitious camera. Um, and it was, 
modern in, in how it uses the, the film language, you know, to, you know, really being choosy about when to give the audience information, when to withhold information, and, um, you know, keeping you hungry, you know, hungry and then feeding you almost like you're, you know, the audience is like a trained seal or something, you know, but you, what's the next thing, you know, keeps you, keeps you engaged as opposed to just, again, uh, the dump truck <laughs> dumping you. We have to start on location. Um, so if you go over, then it, uh, you know, you move from the, you know, stuff you can control the least to the stuff you can control the most. Um, so yeah, we were on location for like half the shoot, which is 16, eh, something like two and a half weeks probably. Um, and we had a cover set, which is in half, of, we had half of the interior of the house on location. Um, so uh, the weather didn't cooperate, which often it wouldn't, you know, it was either sunny, which you can't portray as, you can't even put rain machines and make a storm if it's sunny out. So, you know, so it was either sunny or it was so windy that you actually can't use equipment because it'll blow over and it's dangerous. Um, we got shut down one, one night, just, you know, we just waited and eventually we just couldn't have uh, lights in the air or, or grip frames or much else. Um, so yeah, anyway, after that, uh, then we moved to, uh, we had an upstairs set in an airplane hangar nearby. So that, you know, just the, the bedroom. And then we went back to Halifax um, and we did all the other interiors. So which had the light, light tower, the entire inside that was, you know, a 50 foot high inter interior set um, and the other, you know, parts of the house. Uh, the Witch would have been shot film had we been able to. Um, so it was nice to get back and then, you know, set a precedent too, and we hope to keep going forward. But uh, in particular, um, black and white negative just looks different than, than color negative too. It just has its own physical presence. It's, you know, it's chunks of silver, you know, embedded in, a, in an emulsion, you know, whereas uh, even color film, it just has a more toothy dimensional feel and when you look at it, you know, it, to put it in totally subjective terms, but also um, just has more local, we call local contrast. So, you know, even if the contrast is overall the same, you set your shadows the same as the color example and the highlights in the same place. For some reason, the mid tone, everything in the middle separates more. You know, if you have a gray tone or a skin, it just, all the little local details, even though there's more grain, it's, uh, it's, it's emphasized. So. I wanted to keep going in that direction. That's where the, uh, we came up with a filter also to emphasize uh, texture. Um, it actually, lo it, it's a cyan filter that Schneider made for us. Um, replicates very early emulsions that were uh, insensitive to red. Um, so, uh, but overall what that tends to do is lower the overall contrast a little bit, which you can adjust back in printing. Um, but yeah, it lowers overall contrast, but uh, it, it tends to heighten local contrast too, you know, especially on skin tones, which are mostly red, of course, so, um, which the film can't see. So uh, any little variation of, of red is further amplified. So when you blemishes, pores, you know, you're a little hungover and you, your cheeks are red, that, you know, all gets amplified. Also, it's, it's also just a way to make it more uh, tactile, you know, it's more physical. You know, and uh, there's actually a shot at the end um, in, the, in the lantern room that I don't really talk about much because it's just one shot. But you know, actually, instead of the filter, we used a cyan light on Robert Pattinson's face, and I actually, uh, over the course of the takes, slowly dimmed from cyan to red. So um, what you'll notice that first the blood on his face gets spoiler gets lighter and lighter, you know, and, and the red kind of goes away. And then we sort of come up on the exposure, and he's overexposed. But you'll notice that. Uh, the lips and the eyes change, and the blood, you know, on the on the on the skin too. So um, we kind of go from a blue filter look to a red filter look, which is kind of going from this very physical, mundane sort of tactile reality to the you know this otherness and you know um, the profound, whatever you know. Um. I think before we were even greenlit, I was just so so excited. I. Uh, went to Panavision and they were willing to accommodate a, t a lens test. So um, I just test on the Alexa and I know that with film it react differently, but at least all the lenses would be seen on the Alexa and then you could go from there. But um, 
Yeah, I tested, uh, I mean, on the Witch, I test a lot of vintage lenses, um, so I kind of knew what that's about, and I've shot stuff since that got to know, you know, kind of a, the mid-century lenses pretty well, you know, from the Cook Series 2s to the, Bal you know, Super Baltars and uh, the Kawas and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I wanted, just wanted to see how far I could take it, you know, uh, if, if you went really further back and um, to even older designs, you know, would it suit the film? And it would just be too extreme where it just feel like a, a gimmick, you know? So I was trying to find that balance because um, I want something that really was photographic, uh, whatever that means to you. And, but, um, yeah, so I just wanted to see how far I could take it. So I tested, um, what did they have? Well, I, went, I went there and said, well, what do you have that's off menu that maybe I haven't uh, seen? So they had like a modern lens that they detuned. They had a, uh, I tried some swing shift, but those are really modern lenses. Uh, what else was in there? Um, there's a 1903 or 1905 like triplet uh, that I think they had on There Will Be Blood that they put in an anamorphic adapter. Anyway, they took it back off. Um, what else? And then they had, you know, something else that I don't remember. Oh, Quick Series 1, which I was a little familiar with, but I wanted to test it against the other stuff. And, uh, you know, they said, here are some Baltars. I said, oh, I, I know the Baltars. I was like, really? Because these aren't super Baltars. They're Baltars, um, which uh, were not from the 60s. They're uh, from the 30s uh, before even reflex cameras. So, um, but you can use on a digital camera because, you know, they... they they're just aligned to where you know the back of the lens could be very close to the what was the um, the film, and then you'd use a viewfinder or a um, yeah viewfinder mm -hmm. uh, to compose uh, or a digital camera. Um, but anyway, uh, the lenses I fell in love with were, were these Baltars, which just had a very shimmery quality. I mean, if you, if you use them wide open, they go they kind of fall apart and it just looks smeary. Um, but at like a two eight to a you know two eight and two thirds, it's it was just the look that um, that just took me to that. It just would help you take you to that world. Um, so, uh, yeah. Then they adapted them um, to uh, to a, a, a modern film camera with a spinning mirror. So I don't know how they do that. Respace the elements and, and whatever, because the technician said, "Oh, you can you can't use these with film." And then Dan Sazaki, you know, once again, just did it. Uh, we went to Photochem. Um, I test. We we sent stuff to a few labs more locally, um, but it just the scan w wasn't as good, um, and uh, it wasn't nearly as clean. And I think it just even though it was more expensive to ship it, uh, the producers were just more comfortable too. That you know there weren't going to be surprises from the lab. Shot, yeah, we shot Double X, which is the last the last film around. I prefer Plus X, actually. Double X looked a little dull um, in comparison back when you had both. Um, uh, I, helped, I think I helped it a little bit. It was, I just pulled it uh, half a stop, um, which is equivalent of like a one zone compression. But then you add the contrast later. But what it, it just gets rid of the toe and the, and the shoulder a bit. So um, it just has a linear response to the shadows. And it just over, overall just gives you a little more latitude on this old film that is kind of cranky. Um, but it still has a, a lot less uh, shadow room than color film or digital or, you know. Well, it would have, you know, it would have been great to shoot under real oil lantern, but uh, the, the, it was more important to have the texture of black and white film. So, um, so the, the light actually got compromised in service of the film this time. Um, but I think it still looks good. It's somewhere between you know, a motivated light source and uh, an older style of filmmaking, you know. So I don't, I mean, they never used uh, practical sources like, like we did in this movie. So it's a, it's a mix of modern and, and um, you know, old style lighting. Uh, the box speed is uh, 250 in daylight. I pulled a half, so I considered it, you know, let's go down, you know, so I put it at 160, which is two thirds really. Um, after pulling, and then uh, the filter brought it down to 80. Um, so yeah, shooting at 80 for most of it, but the, the night interiors, it's tungsten, and then I had this filter that cut all the, out all the red light. Well, tungsten is mostly red light, 
So you lose another two thirds of stop. So then, uh, you know, the, the really dark scenes, you know, next to a lantern were actually shot at 50. So they had a, you know, 500 watt bulb uh, or whatever it was. Maybe it was 800, I can't remember anymore. It was just right there, the actors seeing spots, which I still feel bad about, but they've been very gracious and not uh, complaining too much. Um, but yeah, it was very, it was blindingly bright. It took some pre visualization for sure, you know. Like, is this a moody scene? I don't know, you know, because we're not used to these light levels. You know, the witch uh, used, I mean, it was like, it was like 15 times more light than the witch, you know. So, or you could just have a can, you know, a triple wick candle and you're good to go. So, yeah, this is, this is kind of a big adjustment for everybody. Because there's less shadow uh, detail in the negative, uh, I had to kind of relearn how to use fill light because with modern materials, you're used to just sort of, you're next to a white wall and that's fine. In fact, you're kind of taking down bounce over here, but light just falls off more rapidly. Um, so, uh, which kind of helps because the interior set was actually white, you know, which isn't great for if you're trying to make a moody scene. But so, the, you know, if, if, if the light here and, you know, the actor's here and, you know, the wall's eight feet away, it's gonna be a little darker, which helps. Um, so, uh, but yeah, but a lot of times I had to bring in a little more fill and a little more active fill, you know, bounce board wasn't going to do it. You got to, you know, let's, let's get a diffusion frame and put a, you know, 400 watt, you know, joker behind it, you know, finding room for that. So that was a whole um, readjustment to, to fill light and, and also not setting the, you know, the threshold of detail on a face is, you know, a lot of times I've done it five stops under, you know, um, but uh, yeah, I get it this time it's four stops under, you know, and you, you learn that in testing and also your first weeks of sh shooting. So it took about two weeks <laughs> to find uh, how to best use this film stock and where you should set your values. I was definitely going around with a, with a spot meter uh, to, to set those within the narrow parameters of, of the film, Spe including the blown out, the windows, which, you know, it's like you want them to glow, but, you know, with, with these optics, it easily would become overwhelming. So I had nets on the other side of the window that just covered the part that the camera saw to keep it bright, but not, you know, um, but keep it professional, <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I'm a little proud of the key sequence because it's, it's Robert Pattinson, you know, climbs the stairs, just try, you know, he's gonna go for the book and he changes his mind and, oh, he sees the keys, he's gonna go for the keys. And like, no, you know what, I'll just kill them all together. Gets his knife out. Um, you know, in film school, uh, they, they teach you how to do it, right? You, you know, get your wide shot, he walks up, and then you have, you know, his reaction, and then you have what he's looking at, and his reaction, what he's looking at. And uh, I just didn't want to do it that way <laughs> for some reason. So, and I, you know, and it, it just felt like one shot, if you could do it, and the first cut, again, thinking of the first cut, uh, that, you know, giving that first cut more impact, you know, and trying to save that first cut for when Willem wakes up, and what's the most, uh, extreme version. Well, it's, it's an eye, you know, opening and, um, you know, and what if he played his first line over his eye, you know, which kind of mirrors the lens and uh, just there's kind of a running theme of, of eyes and apertures and uh, the light. So um, it all seemed to make sense. But yeah, it's just kind of, it's almost like hand acting where it, it almost looks like, I just realized this last night, it's like almost like Brothers Quay or something, you know where it's just a, a hand and then you can, the camera's sort of telling the story, but it didn't feel, I don't know, maybe lots would disagree with me, but it didn't feel, it's very uh, muscular or just kind of, it's like forcing you to look here at the, these moments and maybe it's a little on the nose, but it just felt right. So, and, but I, I was just nice to find a way to not do, you know, and so.